Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Geld show, direct from the Harvard Business School, Professor John Davis, who teaches uh, and researches about family businesses and family wealth. John, real pleasure to have you. Thank you, Doug. So just to understand a little more of the specifics of what you do, could you describe the difference between, let's say, a regular entrepreneurial startup and a family business? Yeah, you know, the the definition now, which is widely accepted in our field, is that a family business is one that is controlled through ownership by a single family, where two or more family members influence the direction and policies of the company. So uh, an entrepreneurial company, you know, you, you could be an entrepreneur that, and your family technically may own it, but if no one else in your family along with you has any influence over that business, I wouldn't consider it a family company. Now, having said that, you know, about two thirds of all the companies in almost any economy are family companies. No kidding. Okay, yeah. so I guess I'm a perfect example. The, my day job is that I'm a financial advisor. I run sort of a, a niche business in Jerusalem. We deal with people who used to live in America and now they live in Israel or generally anyone who's not living in America but wants to have a U.S. brokerage account and U.S. financial services. And my, my partner and co-owner, in fact, is my wife who is the CFO and also a licensed investment advisor. So I'm just clarifying this is what you mean by a family-run business. Yeah, that's a good example of it. And there are plenty of couple-owned businesses and uh, – millions of them, and also businesses that are owned by, you know, uh, a, a father founder and his kids or a, um, or her kids now, and, uh, or by siblings, brothers and sisters who own companies together, or cousins and later generations who own companies together. Now, I'm, just, I'm glad you brought up that exact example, which is the, you know, the father or the parents on the business. And at a certain point, they then want to bring their children into the business. And there's so many stories that you hear about, you know, they say why uh, you shouldn't work for a family-owned business because bad enough you have to answer to the father, but it's going to be much worse one day when you have to answer to his son. Is that true or is that just kind of a myth? No, I think there, well, I, I think it, it, there's some truth in it because sometimes when the next generation is not capable or capable and arrogant, uh, people don't want to work for them and would much rather work for the founder or the senior generation who they respect and get along with better. So there's some truth to that. You find these examples. But in general, what we see is that family companies uh, are have much more loyal work forces much much greater internal loyalty, much greater loyalty to suppliers and customers. And, and there was a recent uh, survey done by uh, Edelman, which is the largest public relations firm in the world, based in New York City. And they, they were looking at family companies all over the world. And um, the public trusts family companies significantly more than non-family companies. That's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that I see something. So now, uh, let me let me pick your brain here for some advice because my oldest child is twenty one, and she's <clears> in <throat> school now. And at a certain point, uh, the fact is we don't even know if it's appropriate for our four kids to ultimately enter the business. But you know, certainly we feel like for twenty years we've been building this up, and I know that this is an issue that comes up with family businesses. A, how do you know if your kids are right for it? And B, is it appropriate to bring kids into the business? Well, it's, it's, an, it's very appropriate to bring kids into the business. You know, there, anytime you favor your kids uh, through, in employment, in, in passing ownership to them, it's called nepotism. And nepotism has a distinctly bad tinge to it. Right. But, it but in truth, there are there are. Uh, forms of nepotism that work out great and other forms of nepotism that work out really awfully. And so you, you want to, if you're going to bring your kids into the business or if you're going to pass your business to your kids in ownership, you want to get them ready, get them prepared because both ownership and jobs and management really require good preparation and not everybody is suited for it. So you should have standards in your family that say, 
to get a job in this business, you must do X. You must complete a university degree. In some cases, I see families saying you have to have an MBA, outside work experience, et cetera, et cetera, before we let you in. Yeah, I think the outside work experience is probably a very important idea. We're talking to John Davis, a professor in the Harvard Business School who specializes in family-run businesses, and I guess I've taken advantage of a few minutes of our conversation to talk about my own business, which is a family-owned business. And, John, I'm going to keep taking advantage of that because I have a feeling a lot of people might have questions. If you want to bring your kids in, and I got to tell you, I love my children and I trust them and I think they're brilliant. But watching other people, oftentimes, you know, you'll see that a, a parent is very hesitant to trust his child to do something and often will, especially maybe even a controlling parent who is used to controlling everything because he controls the company. How can he learn to trust his children and to really turn over the reins to them? Well, owner-operators of companies tend not to be very trusting of anybody, and they tend to over-control. Not everybody, it's not true for everybody, but I think in general, that's a, it's a true statement. And one's own children, the control tends to go up a bit in many, in many cases, probably most cases, because not only are you concerned about your company, but you're also concerned that your kid doesn't fail at something. And both of those are understandable feelings on uh, for parents, but they both get in the way of development. And you must let your subordinates and especially your kids who may eventually run this thing uh, have some latitude so they can succeed, fail, understand themselves better, prove themselves to others, etc. So what would be maybe one or two techniques you would suggest as your kids are in their 20s and ready to begin to get involved in the business? Well, number one, as I said, you need to have qualifications and make sure not just the parents, but somebody outside the family also evaluates the the children according to these qualifications. It could be an advisory board member for some companies, but maybe just a friend of the family, maybe, maybe a good professional that you work with who you have. So you have some kind of uh, outside benchmarking that's going on. But the second thing is, you know, you want to be able to get, uh, have very clear expectations in the next generation about what they're going to do when they come in, how fast they'll move, what jobs they'll get, what they'll get paid, how they'll, what decisions they will be involved in. Those kind, that kind of expectation setting in advance doesn't take a whole lot of time, but it's fundamental. And then when they come in, Doug, you really do need to challenge them and hold them accountable. And, and it's a friendly thing because you want your kids to succeed. But 90%, honest to God, it, it's got to be like this. Uh, maybe more of the family businesses that I've worked with over 30 years don't do formal performance reviews with their kids. Do they do it with their other staff members? They're poor at it in general. It's a hard thing but, to do. <laughs> It's a very hard where human beings are not just wired to avoid it. They're wired not to do it. Well, I mean, you're working with someone every day and it seems awkward as a boss. I can tell you this it seems awkward to call in someone we talk to all the time. And say, you know, I'm going to sit, sit you down and tell you what I think of you. And, yeah. it's, you know, it's easy when it's good. But if there's any criticism, it's, it's very tricky. And certainly I, I could hear that's difficult with kids. Oh, completely. I, I get the humanness of the dilemma. But we also know that if we don't do it, we run into binds. People, people can end up you know, performing for a long time in a company thinking they're doing okay or even good when they're not doing well for you at all. And that's unfair to them. Right. And it's, and it's unfair to the other staff members as well as the clients. Yeah, ultimately. yeah, absolutely. So how do you deal with the, uh, the feelings of the other staff members? In other words, the people who are not going to get promoted as quickly as your kids because they're not going to get to be the owner of the company one day. Yeah. Well, they have to see that there's a quid pro quo here, that family members, if they're good, go faster, further faster. But in return for that, they're more committed, more capable, try harder, set a better example, that that's the quid pro quo. And when people see that, they, they tend to see family members as not only offering stability for the future, this family ain't going to sell the business. You know, we've got longevity here, but also a sense of 
purpose and a sense of commitment to the culture, blah, 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 it works. And, and that's how fa- family businesses in general build great cultures and have more loyal employees because that quid pro quo is in, is in effect. Interesting. All right. So let's let's leave off with the final question is, ultimately, are there financial advantages or disadvantages of setting up a family business? Well, yes, uh, in a number of ways. We know from research in a number of countries now over different periods of time that family companies, maybe surprisingly to every all your listeners, family companies perform better. And not just by a little bit, but by significant margins on a number of financial metrics. So family companies do better, but they also take more work because you're not only managing the business aspect of whatever you're doing, but you've also got family involved. There are family relationships. You have to think about ownership interests and ownership concerns. And you've got to be prepared ultimately to give attention to all three of those areas, family business ownership. And if you're not, you usually stumble or, or, you know, have some real problems. And sometimes it causes the business to unravel. So is it, is it advantageous to do it? Yes. Family companies can, you know, most industry leaders, here's something. Most industry leaders are family controlled businesses. No kidding. Interesting. One of the things that you're describing, it sounds like that you have to do a lot of work. In other words, you're saying in order to have the family and keep everyone involved, then you have to deal with the problems of nepotism and the the younger generation has to prove themselves. Maybe it just simply is that for whatever the reason, the family companies succeed more simply because more people who care about the end result are working harder. And if we believe that there is a correlation between hard work and success, uh, this might be a good place to see it. Yeah, I think that that's a very good, uh, uh, you know, kind of um, understanding of what's actually going on in these companies. All right. John, we are just about out of time. We're talking with John Davis from the Harvard Business School. He's also the author of a book called Generation to Generation, Life Cycles of, Life Cycles of the Family Business. John, in the last few seconds, just tell us, how can people follow you and follow your work? Well, if you go to the Harvard Business School website, you'll see an executive program that I run called Families in Business. I really encourage people to check it out. You can also get to a number of my published work, and even see some videos of me. If you go to Cambridge Family Enterprise Group, my advisory firm, uh, you can really learn about our practice with families. Okay, we will put a link to that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. John Davis, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Doug. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world. If you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show. 